Thank you. For those of us who have put in our names on the chat and for those who are just uh, joining us, good morning, good afternoon, welcome to the webinar. Kindly put in your name, your organization and location in the chat. Thank you very much. You are all welcome to this webinar on evidence-based approaches to addressing sexual violence. This is the very first of its kind for us as Sikona and SSLN projects together. The delicate nature of delicate nature and as well the sensitivity of this topic cannot be overemphasized. Neither can its role and contribution to HIV prevention and the incidence and prevalence in Sub-Saharan Africa be overestimated. We are very excited to have you here and I'm glad to chair this webinar. My name is Madonna Emmanuel. I work on both the SSLN and Sikona projects. So please feel free to relax and let's chat as colleagues. Let's hear about the evidence-based approaches we've used and let's hear some best practices that will be shared here today. And of course, we'll have a discussion session where we can all talk about the sexual violence and how it affects the HIV prevention programs we run in our countries. Our objective for this webinar is that at the end of this webinar, we are able to provide a comprehensive review of the evidence-based strategies and best practices for the response to and the prevention of sexual violence. We also intend to share innovative methods and case studies that have shown success in different places in Sub-Saharan Africa in addressing sexual violence and promoting HIV prevention. We, we, we hope that we'll be able to foster dialogue and collaboration among stakeholders from diverse and different sectors, including all of you here from government representatives, civil society organizations, youth, adolescent girls and young women. We hope that at the end of today, you'll be able to foster, we'll be able to foster dialogue and collaboration among you all. And as usual, with all SSLN events, you know you can always reach us after this program. You can always go to the website. But even the past Sikona projects we've done, all our webinars, all the tools we've shared and case studies and all, you can always see in the SLN website. So please, you're welcome, sit back and relax. And if you're just joining us, my name is Madonna Emmanuel. I'll be chairing this webinar. Please kindly put in your name, your location and organization in the chat box. Thank you. Our lineup for today's webinar include our uh, opening remark from Dr. Daniel. Dr. Daniel is from uh, the Ghana AIDS Commission. And then we'll have best uh, practices that will be shared by our partner colleagues from Pop Council. We'll also have some beautiful case studies that we will all, we all may connect with. And we'll have a wonderful discussion session where we'll share our viewpoints. So please, let's dig in slowly. And please, at any time, should you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat so that we don't get, uh, we don't run out of time at the end. Thank you very much. On this note, I'd like to welcome Dr. Daniel for his opening remarks. Thank you very much. Dr. Daniel, please. Thank you, the moderator. Good morning, good afternoon, colleagues, from wherever you are. I hope you can be able to see Dr. Daniel. I'm sure many of you have seen me. I hope my camera is on. It is, Dr. Daniel. It is. I'm not able to see myself. OK. <laughs> so good afternoon, colleagues. I am pleased to be part of this important conversation. Dr. And Daniel, the, we cannot hear you. Oh, yes. We can so hear you. Can you hear me now? Can we you hear me? Fine. Yes, your heart, Dr. Yeah, Daniel. You, you, maybe okay, your mind. I'm Dr. Daniel Biamkama. I am from Uganda. I work with the Uganda AIDS Commission as the head of the HIV prevention department. I am pleased to be part of this conversation. And the, the reason is clear. It's that sexual violence impacts on uh, our HIV prevention efforts. Recently, we had a meeting in uh, Ghana where we were discussing PrEP. Mm -hmm. And after our fruitful conversation, I bumped into Kerry. And spontaneously, I asked her whether she can support us, support Uganda, 
trying to find out what is wrong with post-exposure prophylaxis. And the reason why I was concerned with post-exposure prophylaxis is mainly because of sexual violence. So in our conversation, I put it to her. I said, look here, this is PrEP. Many people who should be taking PrEP have not been exposed. They don't feel any urgency to take PrEP. Yet we have an epidemic of people who have been violated, who have made mistakes. The urgency and the motivation to use ART for prevention is clear. We are guaranteed they would adhere. It would be a short time. Why don't we put as much effort on strengthening PrEP, I mean PEP, as PrEP? And of course, her feedback was that, let's go back to Uganda, we develop a concept, and we see, we conduct a study. What is standing in the way of making PEP as popular, as visible as the other prevention tools? So I am pleased that we're having this conversation because my conversation, my request to Kerry, was really inspired by what I know happens in my conference. If I can use it statistics, if we look at our statistics, we find that from birth up to around 14 years, the HIV prevalence for boys and girls is almost the same, around 1.3%. Something strange happens. Something strange happens that once the girls and the boys get to around 15 years, the HIV prevalence in girls shoots up around 0.3%. But for girls, by the time they get to 19, between 15 to 19, the average prevalence is more than the difference family youth violence. You will agree with me that after 15, both boys and girls have hormones, a full dose of hormones, capable of engaging in similar activities, sexual activities. But why is it different for young girls? Why is prevalence much higher? It is partly and mainly due to sexual violence. And there is evidence to support that, of course. The evidence is found in the violence against children studies that we do. We regularly conduct through our means of gender, labor and social development. We regularly conduct violence against children studies, which show clearly that the, the sexual violence against the girls compared to boys is markedly disproportionately higher. In fact, at the last dissemination of our violence against children report, it was stated the statistics show that at least time they had five percent. So at the seminary meeting, when they presented the statistic of 35 percent, 35 percent of all girls, by the time they get to 18 years, they have been sexually violated. I expected us to really storm to walk to parliament to protest. So 35 percent is a really big number. 35% is a third. If it doesn't have include your neighbor's daughter, it mostly includes uh, your child or your brother's child. It, it comes home. One out of three are so many. That is the reality. And it really comes home. I will share with you a story. One of the champions from Uganda, because she's public, if we gave her a platform at one of our meetings, she is public, she shares her status. She's a young lady living positively a one-time beauty queen in Uganda. So she's an HIV positive former beauty queen in Uganda, but she contracted HIV through virus. She would be willing to share her testimony. And I think one time we'll get a chance in one of our meetings. If we give her a chance to speak, she will share. Very pretty girl, young woman, but a relative came and visited her at home. And while they had gone to work, she was like eight years old. She was raped. And this girl is living with HIV. And I work with her closely because she's a really strong advocate of women empowerment and, um, and um, women's rights. So the issue of violence against women, most especially including violence against boys, because recently as we did our, our recent studies, 
we see the number of new HIV infections among teenagers is all beginning to, to surpass of youngers, and we are concerned that the virus community an impact PMTCT, our MTT and they are mainly specifically features as a key contributing factor to mother to child transmission. So the reality is that a significant proportion of our HIV transmission remains uh, uh, through sexual violence. We have come up with the interventions which are not uh, producing the results we want. Recently at our national meeting, we had been, we did the most recent survey. We did the most recent survey, we did a survey, the modeling, the spectrum modeling, and we are disappointed that in spite of all the efforts we have put in, uh, through DREAMS and other related programs, the number of new HIV infections among adolescent girls and, and women is still high. But I must be clear that the interventions we have relied on to address the challenge of virus, including the laws, have not worked. I can give you an example. We have laws in Uganda that uh, make illegal marrying of girls before they are 18, leave alone having sex with a girl below 18. But as I talk now, 34% of all girls get married of for their 18 in Uganda. 34% is so high. So you can imagine how many engage in sexual activity and how many of those are through violence. And if we don't address those robustly, we remain with a challenge of continued spread, spread of HIV, most especially among adolescent girls and young women. So the issues of laws as a key support tool for the prevention program, they don't appear to be working. And even the issue of PEP that I talked about, that if girls are abused, are violated, they can easily access PEP. It remains a key challenge that only a very small proportion of the violence, documented violence that we know happens in our society, access this PEP. So this conversation is timely. We need to come up with a robust plan to address violence against children, to remove all the barriers that really interfere with intervention measure, interventions that will help them uh, avoid contracting HIV after the virus. For us, we are for HIV prevention. The other part of moral change, the part of legal, we can leave it to other people. But we really must advocate for that space to make sure that every person who is unfortunate to be violated does not contract HIV. And I still maintain that from a perspective in Uganda, Violence, especially against women, remains a key contributor of HIV transmission, which eventually results in a significant transmission of HIV to babies and the, a condensed plan of how we are going to deal with vice and the response and effective response to violence and ending HIV transmission through violence is timely. And I'm glad to be part of this conversation. And I thank you for an opportunity to address you. So thank you. This is for me. Dr. Dan Biamkama from the Uganda AIDS Commission. Thank you so very much, Dr. Daniel. Thank you. Uh, though we meet some parts, but it's so uh, um, it, it's so encouraging to hear the work you are doing in Uganda, and of course to understand the brain behind the webinar and everything so far. If you are just joining us, colleagues, please put your name and your organization and location on the chat box. And please mm -hmm. sit back and relax as we continue. The whole objective of this webinar is that at the end, we are able to provide you with the support that you need to support those who have experienced this and to be able to see other best practices and how people are doing this in their own countries. Thank you very much. The next thing we have on our agenda is the best practices uh, presentation from our colleagues from Pop Council. We have Julie, Karen, and Sayota coming up shortly. Pop Council, you're highly welcome. Please go ahead, thank you. Good 
Good morning, good afternoon, colleagues um, joining from various places around the globe. My name is Julie Pullerwitz, and I'm based at the Population Council. The uh, Population Council is an organization focused on sexual reproductive health, HIV, and other global issues, and generating evidence to strengthen programs and policy. And so we're a partner on Sakona and are really happy to be here today to share some of the results um, from our evidence review. I'm joined by my colleagues, Karen Kirk and Sanuk Damathar, and they will also be giving part of the presentation. And we're focused on, as was mentioned earlier, best practices to prevent and respond explicitly to sexual violence. Next slide, please. I'd first start, uh, I thought, by highlighting the magnitude of the problem. Um, and as Dr. Daniel described in his opening remarks, women and girls' experiences of sexual violence is very common across geographies. Across about one third of 15 to 24 year olds experience intimate partner violence in their lifetime. And specifically in low and middle income countries, lifetime experience of partner violence is higher in East and Southern African regions. And when we think about the links between HIV and violence, we know that women who experience violence are significantly more likely to acquire HIV. And at the same time, persons who recently acquired HIV experience higher rates of sexual violence. And so what do we mean when we say sexual violence? We're using the UN Women WHO definition here, where sexual violence is any sexual act committed against the will of another person, either when this person does not give consent or when consent cannot be given. Next slide, please. We next want to highlight that most evidence prior to this review on sexual violence prevention amongst adolescent girls and young women come from high-income countries. So a 2015 global review of about 150 articles, which showed that there was substantial uh, evidence in the literature, found three promising approaches. At that point, they concluded that school-based dating violence interventions were successful, community-based interventions to create a gender equitable environment by working with both men and boys, uh, boys and girls to support gender equitable attitudes and also addressing child maltreatment via parenting interventions or interventions with children and adolescents, as was also emphasized by Dr. Daniel. So this was promising, but the great majority of studies came from high income countries. Next slide, please. And so we took on this review to fill a, the knowledge gap about what strategies have been tested and found effective in low and middle income countries to prevent and respond to sexual violence experienced by girls and young women. This also came up during discussions with the champions on Sakona and SSLN, many of you who are on the call today, in highlighting violence as a key barrier to successful HIV prevention programming efforts. And so we really focused on the 15 South to South Learning Network countries so we could gather and synthesize existing evidence that is locally uh, relevant, contextually, contextually relevant. Next slide, please. This is an overview of the methodology that we use. The focus of the review is our studies that quantitatively measured effectiveness of interventions for sexual violence. And we're looking at both prevention and response to violence. And we're looking at both partners and non-partners perpetrating the violence. Just wanna highlight that. We looked as a timeline, those articles that have been published since 2015, since we had a good review in 2015 through 2023, so pretty much today. We also ended up screening 642 studies that were in the literature. 
and ended up with 41 that we went into great detail on and extracted all the relevant lessons that we'll be sharing with you in the latter, later part of the presentation. If you look on the left side, you'll see sort of how we got from those 642 citations down to our 41. So we took away references that were duplicate, we screened 550, and then we excluded a number of studies or papers because either they were not in an SLL, SSLN country, they were published before 2015, they were only looking qualitatively at sexual violence and not measuring quantitatively. They didn't focus on an evaluation, issues such as that. And then we ended up in the end with 42 studies or articles that we'll be talking about today. I'm now gonna turn it over to my colleague, Karen, to take us to the next part of the presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Julie. Next slide, please. Uh, so I would like to walk all of you through the takeaways from the intervention approaches and program effects from our review. Next slide, please. To present the findings of our review, we were guided by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and applied a three-level framework of prevention interventions to our review. This framework defines primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention as they relate to sexual violence. So first we have primary prevention, which is what we would think of most commonly when talking about prevention. The aim of primary prevention is to avoid sexual violence occurrence. Examples of intervention approaches for primary prevention would include community sensitization focused on gender equitable norms. Next, we have secondary and tertiary prevention appro intervention approaches. And these can also be described as response approaches. Secondary prevention, or an immediate response, aims to respond directly after SV occurrence. These intervention approaches generally include evaluation and treatment of injuries and provision of other medical services. Other medical services might include pregnancy testing, provision of PEP, like Dr. Daniel was discussing, um, as well as um, counseling, short-term counseling or referral for follow-up care. Finally, tertiary prevention or long-term response intervention approaches focus more on rehabilitation. And this can include reintegration into households or provision of long-term psychosocial support and counseling. Next slide, please. <clears throat> To provide a quick overview of the 41 papers we included, here on this slide, we can see that the majority of the generated evidence related to primary prevention of sexual violence. In addition, most of the available evidence comes from only four of the 15 SSLN countries, and these are South Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. Next slide, please. 84% of primary prevention programs for sexual violence measured an improvement in their sexual violence outcomes. Next slide. Here we can see that the most common sexual violence outcome among primary prevention interventions is experience of sexual violence. And this makes sense. It's logical that experience of sexual violence would be the most common outcome of interest for primary prevention interventions, but you can also see that some of these studies take a broader view and measure additional outcomes related to aspects of sexual violence, such as disclosure, feelings of self-efficacy and empowerment, knowledge of sexual violence and knowledge of available services, psychosocial well-being, and also access and use of health services following sexual violence experience. On the right of this slide, you can see that the approaches that were most commonly used among primary prevention interventions are community and school-based, and they address entrenched gender norms and promote gender equity and knowledge of SV. Next slide, please. And 100% of the secondary prevention or immediate response programs for sexual violence measured improvement in their sexual violence outcomes. Next slide, please. 
Uh, the, you can see from this slide that there were only six publications looking at immediate response to sexual violence. And of these six, four come from Tanzania. The most common outcomes being measured relate to access, use, or provision of health services for sexual violence. In addition to knowledge of sexual violence and available services. So as we mentioned previously, um, there is a known link between sexual violence and HIV. However, only two studies in our, our review measured provision of post-exposure prophylaxis or other HIV services following sexual violence experience. The most common intervention approaches related to immediate response to sexual violence include community-based sexual violence prevention and empowerment as skills building for adolescent girls and young women. In addition, intervention approaches working within the health sector intend to strengthen service delivery for sexual violence victims. Next slide, please. Here again, we see that 100% of the tertiary prevention or longer term response programs for sexual violence measured an improvement in sexual violence outcomes. Next. Here we had eight publications focusing on long term response to sexual violence, and six of them used intervention approaches measuring sexual violence metrics related to psychosocial well being after sexual violence experience. In addition, these, some of these took a broader view as well as we saw with other prevention types and included metrics beyond the psychosocial support. You can see the frequency here. Next slide, please. All right, so now I'd like to take the opportunity to go into more detail about these 10 intervention approaches that we identified from our review. The intervention approaches in the next two slides are organized from the most commonly used to the least common. As you'll remember from my first slide, community-based sexual violence prevention interventions were the most commonly used. These interventions engage communities in social change activities via radio programs, community theater, uh, meetings with local leaders to improve community knowledge and shift attitudes related to sexual violence. The next most common intervention approach relates to adolescent girls and young women's individual capacity building within small group settings. These empowerment and self-efficacy intervention approaches address multiple aspects of the AGYW's life, including violence, HIV risk, economic empowerment, and education. Third, it is well recognized that adolescence is a critical opportunity to address attitudes and behaviors related to sexual violence including shifting gender norms. And school-based interventions have been a promising approach that allows in implementers to engage adolescent girls and young women, as well as their male peers. Next, we have psychosocial and safety support intervention approaches, which generally evaluate short-term counseling and therapeutic tools in settings where traditional ongoing counseling and therapy may not be feasible. Art therapy and phone-based apps can support psychosocial well being among individuals who are exposed to or at risk of sexual violence and can help prevent repeat sexual violence experience. Intervention approaches that focus on economic empowerment provide support to women's groups via microfinance groups or financial or vocational training. Next slide. As Julie mentioned, the review from 2015 found that parenting was a promising approach. However, the review had only identified evidence from high-income countries. In our review, parenting intervention approaches are being used in multi-component programs. These also focus on AGYW empowerment, community-based sexual violence prevention, and school-based components. These parenting intervention approaches recognize the significant role of trusted adults, parents, and caregivers in the lives of adolescent girls and young women. Now, the next two intervention approaches address sexual violence prevention and response from the health system side. First, we have screening and referral for sexual violence cases. Our review found that simple sexual violence screening questions can be integrated into routine care visits and improve perceived support from healthcare providers, which can lead to improved physical and mental health outcomes for those who have experienced sexual violence. In addition, clinical mentoring of healthcare providers can improve service delivery for victims. 
and lead to improved follow-up for medical, psychosocial, and HIV retesting services for victims. In our review, one intervention used a couple-based approach that aimed to increase communication about violence within couples. This intervention was implemented alongside community-based and service delivery components. And lastly, we had one intervention approach that looked at policy change in Malawi and Uganda specifically. These two countries implemented free universal primary education policies and data from Uganda suggests that grade attainment may be protective against sexual violence. So that's the high level presentation of the tested intervention approaches from our review. And now I'm going to be passing the microphone to Sanyukta who will share summary recommendations for various stakeholder types based on these findings. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Karen. Um, and colleagues, let's uh, talk about what this means for you. So let's go to the next slide, please. Great. So we wanted to now pull across these 41 tested interventions on sexual violence and highlight what are some overarching lessons for program implementers. Um, and we lay these out um, kind of broadly and then specifically for the three different ways or levels of uh, prevention and response to sexual violence. So the first key element of the interventions that have been tested engaged community leaders. So we recommend that you do engage key community leaders. This could be religious leaders, this could be uh, local uh, elected officials to address some of the entrenched gender norms. They have a key role to play in the community, so do not ignore them. We, the interventions uh, that we reviewed also uh, emphasize including parents, partners, and male peers in sexual violence prevention and response programming. So don't leave those key groups out. Um, as Karen mentioned, for instance, in the school-based programs, it's really important to engage male peers. So that's a good example of, of inclusion. Um, we, the interventions, uh, tested interventions do focus on multiple touch points with the part program participants. So do design programs that enable a sufficient number of exposures to the intervention. Most of the interventions reviewed had 10 or more touch points with the program beneficiaries. We also suggest uh, that enhanced training and support for community health workers. Most of the programs were being implemented by frontline health workers, community-based volunteers, mentors, who are providing some of the sexual violence education or support, counseling, referral to services. And it's really important that we don't neglect the training and support that those community health workers need in order to provide these services efficiently and also to deal sometimes with the emotional burden of providing sexual violence program or being the point at which um, that program beneficiaries are seeking services and care. So their emotional support and well being becomes very important. We do suggest including programming both for the short term and long term response to sexual violence. As you saw from the review, a lot of the studies that are being evaluated are still on the prevention of sexual violence, which is fantastic. We need to look at how we create programs that are doing that immediate and long-term response to sexual violence and assess if they are being effective for adolescent girls and young women. And certainly, as Karen pointed out, only two of the studies that we evaluated were integrating PEP and PrEP in their post-violence care services. A key point for this group is not to neglect the opportunities to integrate um, sexual violence and HIV prevention programming. Next slide, please. Um, continuing on for some high level lessons for program implementers, when we are thinking specifically about programs to prevent sexual violence, that primary prevention program, don't delay sexual violence prevention programming with boys and girls. As some of the school-based programs show that early adolescence is a critical and opportune time to intervene, so do capitalize on that opportunity. And it's really important to build adolescent girl, young women's individual skills and capacity, their self-efficacy through the mentored safe space group. So all of the groups that were doing those empowerment self-efficacy programs were doing them in a space where young women could discuss their experiences, 
uh, their perspectives. Uh, of course, the secondary prevention programs, the ones that provide immediate care after sexual violence, there's an opportunity to integrate screening questions for sexual violence into anti antenatal care and HIV service points. Points that, uh, and Dr. Daniel referred to this at the beginning of his presentation, service points where young women are accessing services are the key place to um, integrate simple screening questions. We also suggest that we don't neglect the training of healthcare providers to screen for and provide supportive counseling for sexual violence. So with providers, and, and this is a key point for provider behavior change programming, when providers are seen as being supportive and open, uh, there's women are much more likely to report sexual violence and seek post-violence care services. And in order to provide long-term support, the tertiary support, do think about psychosocial support through trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, and as well as alternative approaches like art therapy. So there is some really interesting and innovative work going on around this, um, and we need to dig a little deeper into the long-term support for um, the tertiary prevention of sexual violence. Next slide, please. We wanted to highlight also some key lessons for some of our colleagues who are policymakers on this webinar and what are some of short-term and long-term um, actions that um, you all can support to continue the effort on this. So there is, of course, I think the need to dedicate funding and efforts specifically for sexual violence programming for adolescent girls and young women. We also don't want to overlook opportunities for integrating sexual violence within HIV platforms. And I think the next three, which are sort of medium to long-term issues that we need to address is that we don't really know how to create supportive, respectful and accessible police or judicial systems um, for those immediate uh, response to sexual violence or the long-term response. So there isn't evidence yet from uh, the, from our, our country context that we were focused on, the 15 SSLN countries, on how to do this well yet. Um, so we shouldn't assume that those are, even though laws are in place, that those systems are accessible, respectful, and supportive of adolescent girls and young women. There is also a need to ensure that we have relevant evaluations from underrepresented regions, uh, like in West Africa. So a lot of the evidence, as Karen pointed out, comes from those four countries, which is wonderful, but we need to look at what are the context specific um, differences um, in other parts of, um, of, the, of the country and of the continent. Um, we need to prioritize policies to support economic empowerment and access to education for adolescent girls and young women. So this is of course a long-term strategy thinking about in, in places where education is highly valued in contexts where education uh, serves as a key um, lever for change. Uh, the, the one policy review does show that access to universal primary education shifted experience of sexual violence. So thinking about how these longer term policy adjustments can improve sexual violence for adolescent girls and young women. Next slide, please. And finally, for researchers who are working on sexual violence, there are a number of recommendations on what we need to do to fill the continuing evidence gaps. So the first actually is to recognize that there is a large and growing evidence base on primary prevention strategies for sexual violence. And related to that is that the need for testing secondary and tertiary prevention um, or sexual violence response approaches among adolescent girls and young women. We do need to expand the geography of where sexual violence programs are being tested. Um, a key aspect here is that when these research, this research is being done, we do recommend delinking measures of sexual violence so it can be specifically tracked. Often studies will say people experience physical or sexual violence, and it's really important for the link between sexual violence and HIV to kind of delink and look at those measures specifically. Similarly, it's really important to ensure that analyses are segmenting results by age groups, specifically for adolescent girls and young women. So a lot of times we find that the results are presented for a large age range and the results aren't separated out for 15 to 19 year olds or 20 to 24 year olds. 
And it's unknown whether the results for a 35 or 40 year old woman would be the same as for AGYW. So it's really important in the research going forward that we segment the data by age groups. And we do need to generate evidence on sexual violence prevention, particularly among marginalized groups. So there's some emerging evidence, but much more needs to be done. For example, for people with disabilities, people in the sexual and gender minority spectrum, to really understand what are some new and innovative ways of addressing sexual violence amongst key populations. Uh, next slide, please. I will end here. We have a couple of strong slides at the end with some definitions and the list of citations that are included in our review. And we look forward to questions. Uh, Madonna, I'll pass back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sayeta, Julie, and Karen. You were quite wonderful. And thank you for having recommendation for the different sectors that are required to uh, make sexual violence a thing of the past, especially in relation to HIV prevention. Colleagues, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. It was wonderful. I enjoyed it as well. And this also goes to demonstrate that every hand needs to be on deck. It's not a one-person show to be able to do this. The reason why we share best practices are learning exchange events based on the Sub-Saharan African content and contest is so that we can see how feasible it is to use limited resources in our settings to do the work that we do. Next up would be spotlights on innovations, case studies that of things that's been done in relation to this. Before we show the video that we'll play right now, I will implore you to uh, sit back and look at this from a logical point of view. Please do not be, uh, it's, it's sensitive. So I wouldn't want you to feel very sad, but I want you to look at it from a positive point of the work that people are doing to ensure that things are better and hope during the discussion session that we can all share our feedback. Thank you very much. Come you can play the video. Can play the video. We are expressing some technical issues, colleagues. Please be patient while we sort this out. Thank you. While we wait, please, if you have questions from the presentations and discussions that have been ongoing, please put them in the chat box. And if you have not put your name yet, if you are yet to put your name in the chat as well, please do so, so we can get to know each other and what we do and where we work. If there is any question you have, something that is not clear about the best practices that were shared just now as well, please feel free to put please them. Feel free to put them. Come on, please go ahead. South Africa is considered to be the rape capital of the world with 10,818 rape cases reported in the first quarter of 2022. The rate at which women are killed by intimate partners in this country is five times higher than the global average. The Haderfel Tutuzela Care Center stands as a beacon of hope on the Cape Flats, serving as one of South Africa's one-stop facilities 
dedicated to providing comprehensive support for victims of rape and gender-based violence. The concept is, is that it is a one-stop center for people that have been sexually violated. Three months shy of my 16th birthday, I was gang raped and my best friend murdered. And as a survivor of such a heinous act or rape, I was not afforded the opportunity for, to, to receive services such as this. Anybody that visits this facility, when you walk in here, you will have an experience of lightness, you have an experience of space. The high ceilings even added, you know, because one of the things, I suffered from claustrophobia for a long time, and then walking into the center, the friendliness, the colors, the light, that added so much difference, you know. Operating within the Hederfeld Community Health Center, the GCC plays a pivotal role in transforming the experiences of survivors by offering social, psychological, medical, and legal services. As we take a step inside, we will show you how the facility is designed and how Tutuzela centers go beyond the basics. Survivors, often from disadvantaged areas, find comprehensive services here. Representatives from key stakeholders will also share insights into their roles. So our involvement here is to make sure that there's um, coordination within the departments that are working here. There is um, smooth running of the center. There is uh, compliance to the blueprint and the site protocols. And above all, there is care. Um, that is given to the survivor at all times, um, fair to everyone. So on arrival, a client will arrive at this facility, there is a reception desk, and at the reception desk there will be um, someone from Rape Crisis that will receive them and will then inform the first responder that we have a client um, that has arrived. We provide a 24-hour service um, and the way in which we do that is to provide um, first responders at the site. My role as the first responder is to meet the client, greet the client and also do containment with the client. That point of, of in between the incident and the medical examination is to contain the person so that the person is more relaxed and more prepared to know what is about to happen to them. So then the third person they will see is then um, our nurse. They will do a HIV test, a rapid test, they'll do a syphilis rapid test and a pregnancy test if indicated. They also take the height and the weight of the patient and they do other basic observations like the pulse, blood pressure, temperature, so on. From there, a client goes um, to the forensic examiner where the forensic examination takes place. When the patient comes, she, she comes with a crime kit. When she comes with the police, I will use the crime kit, first take the history of what happened. And um, uh, that uh, notes will stay in the folder of the hospital. It does not go to court. So I will do the examination and take all the relevant swabs that I need to take from the patient and then close the kit and then call the investigating officer who will be outside. After that, a client will be offered, um, you know, the opportunity to shower um, and then also if clothing has been taken, um, they will also provide them with a comfort pack. In the comfort pack, we've got um, soap and face cloth. You can find a toy in there, a suitable toy for, for which, whether it's a boy or a girl, and there will be resource material in that they could use um, once they leave the center. By then, SAPS would have been informed, and the FCS unit from SAPS will come out and do the statement taking. The uh, victim assistant officer is the last person to see the client. We know that when a survivor comes through our seat and through our doors, that a journey doesn't end here. And this is only the start of a journey. Um, and also we are point of contact for the survivor because going through the criminal justice system can be very scary, it can be very intimidating. That's why we have a database where we feed information to the court and the court feeds information back to the Tutuzela Care Centre. We are that link, you know, we link our survivors 
to the relevant service providers. So that is our role on a daily basis to make sure that the survivor is supported holistically. What is really shocking about, you know, these facilities is the number of children that we see. So this is why at this facility we made specific provision for a kid's room so that kids while they are waiting for services to be, to be provided that they can sit in the kid's room and play um, with toys. So not all our this, the To Desert a Care Centres have a one-way mirror, but the one-way mirror allows the social worker to be able to observe the client. And so it does mean that if it's a child, the child will then be able to play in a, in a safe setting. One is able to use the, and see what the child, what the child or the person is, be how they've been affected or what they're playing with or drawings, and then being able to use that in the therapeutic um, sense with a client. The CCTV room will assist a lot to take the anxiety from the children also when they have to testify because now they're not being expected to go to court where court, everyone looks at it as a scary place. They're going to be testifying in a safe space, in a room where there's toys, there's comfort around them. After the person leaves the centre, they are also then able to access the services again. Or one could, what we also do is having a referral system and a referral pathway for a survivor to go to other services or to other organisations who might be able to assist. Our victims know that they can come back any time if they want help or if they're not sure if something happened, if they want advice. We do not turn people away. When you know that you are helping someone at the end of the day, you are putting a smile to someone who came crying. It's our goal because we, I need to know that I've restored that person's dignity. I've, I've made that person see beyond why she came here for, that there is still a purpose to live. Are we supposed to be excited about the rape care center? I guess not. However, I know that it's for, it's for the survivors, this is a huge plus. So thank you to the Zella Care Center and all the stakeholders and everybody that was involved in in the design and implementation of this of the center this project would not have been possible without the careful collaboration from all stakeholders with the collective vision shared to help gender-based violence victims Thank you so much, Camel, and welcome back, everyone from South Africa. That was quite a very sensitive one. Yeah, thank you. Should you have questions or uh, concerns or anything you want to ask about the case study that we just shared, please put them in the chat and we'll respond to it later. And if you have any question or any thoughts at all regarding the topic of the day, please put them in the chat or you can hold on during the discussion session as well. Now, the final case study we will receive today would be from the Infectious Disease Institute in Uganda. Goretti, you are up. Thank you. Thank you, Madonna, and thank you all. So good afternoon from Uganda, and I'm sharing about leveraging the DREAMS platform to address sexual violence, Uganda's experience. We'll go to the next slide, please. Yes, and my name is Greti Nakabugo. I lead the DREAMS program at the Infectious Diseases Institute and a team of us are all on. Even in the Q&A, more members would like to participate. Thank you. So our next slide, a little about the Infectious Diseases Institute to, for our mission that we exist to strengthen health systems in Africa, a strong emphasis on infectious diseases through research and capacity development. And the program I'm presenting today, IDEA works on six areas, six focus operational areas, and the program I'm presenting today belongs to area six, the health system strengthening. I'm presenting results from our Kampala Regional HIV project that we've implemented for the last five years. 
Thank you. Next slide, please. So the Kampala Regional HIV Project, as Alia shared, it's a CDC funded project and it's 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 been implemented for five years from 2017 to 2023. And the goal is to accelerate HIV epidemic control through scaling up high interventions aimed at achieving the 95-95 targets. Just a little about where we are implementing that pro project is in the urban. We are implementing an urban dreams. I know some of you are familiar with dreams. So this is an urban model, Kampala being a capital city and what are the issues in Kampala? The high HIV prevalence, then the neighboring district being Wakiso. How these issues increase violence for the uh, sexual violence for the girls, high population pressure. The girls are coming in from the rural to the urban. There is a lot of slum area, the hotspots, substance abuse use, and a lot of unemployment, increasing the risks and for the adolescent girls and factors for sexual violence. So that's a bit about the background. Next slide, please. So for those who are interfacing with DREAMS for the first time, we just want to say that it's DREAMS is about determined, resilient, empowered, and ensuring that girls are AIDS-free. And it's, as the center says, to empower girls and young women, reduce their risk to HIV, and the services that you see direct there, post-violence care is one of the key services that we provide on the DREAMS platform. And then a key one also that I need to highlight is social asset building. The other presenters have all highlighted the importance of the girls being in a safe space. When a girl experiences sexual violence, she feels isolated, rejected, and coming to the safe space helps her get a network, interact with a mentor, and be able to open up. So that, that is key. Then we also work with families, and those are the services that we provide. And then we also work with the partners of the girls. So when you someone shared about couple, integrating the GBV, sexual violence prevention for couples, so that's something that we learn as well. Then we also work with communities, that's the SASA approach that we use to ensure that the community is supportive for the adolescent girl and reducing violence. Thank you, that's it about the DREAMS program. would like now to share about deeper into sexual violence from our program, what, are the, what is the data saying from our side? Thank you so much. The next slide, please. Okay, so like we earlier and, and Dr. Daniel noted and all of you noted, sexual violence is a real issue among adolescent girls. For us, the Ugandan data says 16% of the girls have ever experienced violence. So even in their dreams program, it's the same issue that the girls have faced violence. So right from when the girls come in at enrollment, they are, we screen them for sexual violence. And those are the questions that you see on the left, whether a girl has ever been touched in a sexual way and the descriptions that are there. And then also whether the girl has been made to have sex by force. And when you look at that data, you see that 6,444 girls who came in on the program have faced sexual violence right from enrollment in their lifetime when you ask them. Then we also do the routine screening on the program. And still we ask if the girl has been touched in a sexual way, explaining the private parts, because at times for the 10 to 14, you need to go a bit more detail. And we do that. And for the previous year, we thought we would pull out this slide, particularly at the bottom, that for last year, we had 1,337 girls who had faced sexual violence. The next slide, please. So based on the girls that come in, what do we do with the girls? How is our response system? How is our GBV referral network? So we look at first line support as people already shared, we have to ensure that the girls are, have the confidentiality are empowered to share. So we use the lives approach, which I've described there, what the lives means and then the loves approach, we, which we, are, we work, the dream program works with volunteers and with the health workers, it's called lives. 
but with the community volunteers, we call it LAVS, just the change in their O for ongoing connection. So each one on the team is, is trained on LAVS to be able to reach out to practical care and respond to the emotional and physical needs of the girls that have that or the survivors. We also link to the facilities, the probation, the, the district action centers that are within the program. We have action centers within the program. Then work with GBV shelters, just like the previous video we highlighted, would be like, like they highlighted. So we work with a GBV shelter, and then we also work with other civil society organizations to see that the legal issues, a key challenge as we work on sexual violence are the legal issues, but also for further support for trauma counseling. Next slide, please. On the left, just to describe the picture a bit, on the left is a, a district action center, which the program, the district has provided that the local government, then we attach a counselor to it, and we ensure that the survivors are, are, are supported right from nutrition, the counseling and the recovery, and then they are enrolled on the program. It covers boys as well. So for the boys who will not enroll, but they will be referred and supported. The next slide, please. We have many interventions in the DREAMS program that support sexual violence, that address sexual violence, but we thought we'd bring out this particularly, the no means no sexual violence prevention training because of the impact that we've had on it, that it's about empowering adolescent girls with mental, verbal, and physical skills. And the girls learn to set boundaries and defend themselves. As you see there on the left, you see that the girls are given the physical skill on how to attack. The, how to attack the raper? You just use the knee and 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 go and go to his groin. And then below is how do I fight? I've I've negotiated. I've done everything. Below is the fighting stance. How do I stand and and be able to hit? And those are the numbers that we've 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 been able to train on. No means no. And I just want to highlight the disclosures that we've had that. We've had disclosures from the session that the girls have been able to talk, especially when we group them in their survivors in recovery anonymous groups, they are able to disclose a bit more. And we've had 270 disclosures for the 15 to 19 and then for that 9 to 14. And for us, no means no has really worked a lot to empower the girl, as we are going to share in the next in the next slide. Next slide, please. The earlier presenters highlighted economic empowerment and we use the empowerment and livelihood for adolescents model to equip our girls. When the girls know that they, they, they can increase their self-efficacy, they don't have to depend on someone because that person who is abusing them and we train them on financial literacy and then they are, they are supported with a skill, entrepreneurship, and then at the end they are linked to wage employment and even some are linked to credit facilities. And we see there the girls who are undertaking bakery. When this girl has really experienced sexual violence, she feels everything is gone. The esteem and the economic empowerment helps her also to be independent from the abuser and also achieve her goals. So the next one, we are going to share the case studies that we selected from the 137 girls that we supported in the last year. Next slide, please. So allow me to, to, read the, to read her case study in terms of the first person. So I'll say like I'm Jane. Jane, not real name. I'm from Wakiso with primary level education. My parents separated and I initially stayed with my father, but the paternal uncle kept molesting me. I disclosed to my grandmother who demanded that I keep it a secret of the shame to the family. I shared with my mother who immediately moved me to a new home. The distance to school increased and I often missed classes. My stepfather also attempted to sexually harass me. I was desperate to run to any place where I could feel safe. Last year, the Dreams team visited my school. 
And through the No Means Work program, they taught us about violence prevention and how to protect ourselves from sexual harassment. I opened up to one of the facilitators who counseled me and enrolled me on two dreams. The next time my stepfather tried to harass me, I stood up against him. This made him treat me worse. I confided in the dreams liaison officer who made a safety plan with my mother. I was taken to my maternal uncle's place and to a boarding school. I'm thankful to Dreams for paying my school fees, enabling me transfer to the boarding section. Despite the uncertainty of where I would spend my holidays, my time at, has, at school has turned out to be enjoy, enjoyable. I'm happy and can concentrate on my studies, which was not how it was before. The next case study is from a 23-year-old. So we'll transition to the next case study. Next slide, please. Yes, dreams transformed my life. I'm 23 years old. My life before dreams was full of misery. As a sweet girl, I used to get money through transactional sex. My dad was nowhere, and at 12 years, my mom introduced me to this business. It was the only option to get money and cover up the debts that my mom had with the men. I had nothing to do, and actually, this business seemed to be easy. Through it, I had lost my self-esteem until dreams opened up my mind on how I could get money using my brain and vocational skills. As assigned a mentor, counseled and supported to take an HIV test. I thank God I tested negative. I was so happy and immediately joined the Stepping Stones class full of joy and hope. I learned how to live a safe life, use condoms, and also learned about rape. I learned about financial literacy, which opened my mind to the knowledge of saving, planning, and budgeting. We started a saving group and I managed to save $200. This brought joy into my life. I joined the cosmetology class where I was skilled and I trained on makeup, manicure, and pedicure. Now I work with a vocational institute as a trainer of other adolescent girls and youth. I'm so grateful with the transformation, with the transformed successful life. I'm safe from HIV and focused on making money through the skills I acquired. Thank you so much for the opportunity to brighten my future. And just to add as this, girl came into the program she still was into transactional sex so she had to be on prep and i thank the team that didn't judge but they reached out with a positive attitude and supported so i would like to acknowledge cdc for the support that they give us to be able to implement their dreams program and to thank sakona and genetics genesis for allowing us to present thank you so much Thank you so much, Goretti. And thank you colleagues for being here with us for this time. Yes. The next thing on, uh, so far we've had, uh, so far we've had case study from South Africa. And of course the one we just finished from Uganda. And we had earlier the best uh, practices presentation from the Population Council. Now it is time for an open discussion. So if you have questions that have not been addressed, you can share them. If you have concerns or you have experience you want to share, it is a discussion session. So please, the floor is open and would like you to contribute. Tell us what you think, tell us what is happening in your country, tell us what you are doing differently, tell us what you are doing similar to what has been shared today and tell us what you want other countries to learn from you or what you hope to learn. Whatever it is you have to share in relevance to this topic. Please feel free and go ahead. Thank you. Do we have any hands up? Madonna, there was a question from Dr. Shagun, um, and I wonder if either of the presenters might want to reflect on that while others put up their hands. Thank you, Kerry. So we'll go back to the chat. When we go to the chat, we'll see that there are questions that have been answered and some that are yet to be addressed. And I think the one Kerry is referring to is Dr. Shagun's question on the location for the GBV Center 
being in a hospital environment, if it is not stigmatizing, does it not also give an impression that GBV re response is only medical? Hi, Madonna. This is Sanyukta. I can come in. Um, and actually just put it in the chat. Um, just to note, I'm not involved in the Tizella project, so it would be good to hear from those colleagues um, perhaps after the webinar. But I think in general for AGYW, we know that facility-based services are harder to access. The, a lot of adolescent girls and young women fear um, the kind of negative attitudes from healthcare providers and um, sort of stigmatizing attitudes from others in the community who see them going there. I think what was interesting about this case study, though, is that it's a really strong NGO built with young women who are survivors of sexual violence themselves. So they've created that space. They had also separated the space from the hospital. So it was a you know adjacent space. Um, and the kind of the role that NGO and the kind of identity they set up. So I think they're doing all the things that kind of provide services, but also be centered on the experience of women who've experienced violence. So I think that model sets them apart in that way. I think it's often very hard if a sexual violence care provider is sitting within a main facility and everybody can, especially for a young woman, if they, everybody can see them going to a particular uh, desk or a site within the clinic. And those generally have been found to be more challenging. I don't know if my other colleagues on the call or presenters um, from the US or Uganda um, want to come in on this question. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Sayeta. Yes, yeah, someone else wanted to talk. Julie, is that you? Thanks. Yes, thanks so much, Madonna. I would just, uh, I, I don't have a point to add beyond what Sanyuk just said. I think that that's great. And uh, I also was not involved with the project, but I saw that the services, in fact, had been moved from the central hospital, um, where it was a smaller location, a much smaller space, to this separate adjacent space, which was, I think, intending to take it out of the hospital environment and to give it a different impression to the community of survivors as a welcoming space that is apart from the hospital. So kudos to the group. I thought, Sanyukta, you might want to respond to that other question you answered in the chat around the potential engagement of law enforcement and what that what their role is around sexual violence response um, that we found in the review. Yeah, I think actually we looked specifically, you know, because we, uh, as Karen mentioned, we looked at the prevention response at three levels, right? The interventions to prevent sexual violence, interventions that are doing immediate response to sexual violence and interventions that are doing sort of long-term response. And so in that response, you know, the short-term or the long-term response, you would want to see evaluations of programs that are not just providing health services, but are connecting uh, young women, if needed, to law enforcement or legal services, housing rehabilitation, uh, other kind of economic support, the kind of support a young woman uh, or Alison girl, young woman may need if they have experienced violence. Unfortunately, in our review, there was no documented programs that were focused on adolescent girls and young women in our countries that are really looking at the violence response. So there, there is definitely a role to play there isn't a lot of documented evidence on this. And so this is one of the reasons why we were saying that we can't assume that the laws that we're putting in place are being implemented well around uh, and how, uh, if at all, adults and girls and young women are feeling like they could access them, if they are, respect, if they are responsive, respectful, accessible um, to young women and how what the police response is. I know from evidence in other parts of the world that there has to be concerted work with law enforcement officials um, and the kind of supportive services in order to be able to do those service to provide that care and the connection well. So um, it's a notable notable gap in in our evidence, uh, especially in the region. Uh, I'll pause there. I don't know if other colleagues uh, want to come in on that uh, again based on their country level experience. Thank you so much, Senyeta. Um, Just to clarify that the center is on the same ground as the hospital, but not inside. Um, this is with respect to his previous question. Um, also, colleagues, 
If you have more questions about the center, please put them in the chat. We will compile them and share them with our colleagues at the center who would provide response that we will share with you in the email that would go out, go out after this uh, webinar. Unfortunately, they are quite busy at the moment and could not join the webinar so please feel free to reach out to any of us send us messages or put them in the chat we'll compile your questions and then we'll provide you answers when we send the email response now going back to the chat we have another question i think from dr shego as well that is asking about if the dream project support procurement and use of tools like wrappers peppers pepper spray teasers or stunners to protect the girls against sexual violence beyond training on physical response I think this question is for you, Goretti, and any other person on dreams. Okay. Thank you, Dr. David. So for the training, we use the paper sprays, but actual procurement of that, the dreams program does not cater for that. We only use it for demonstration and with the instructors, but the actual, we don't, it's not part of the procurement for the program. I don't know if my colleague Rashida wants to add on to that. Not really, Gorete. We do not use those in Uganda. They're not so common. Thank you both for sharing. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wants to share anything or has questions? Um, colleagues, just to remind you that we would have a poll shortly before we wrap up where you would share feedback about this webinar to help us improve to do better. So please do not miss it. Do not log out before you complete the poll. And uh, before the poll, we we'll still give you a chance to ask your questions and share your concerns about anything related to uh, HIV profession with regards to sexual violence in your country. Thank you. At the beginning of this webinar, we did share that our objective was to provide a comprehensive review for evidence-based strategies and best practices for the prevention of and the response to sexual violence. And then we said we are going to share innovative methods and case studies that have shown success, such as the Tortizella project and the project, uh, the Dream Project for IDI, and that this has shown success in addressing sexual violence and promoting HIV prevention. And finally, we were hoping to foster dialogue and collaboration. So colleagues, these were the objectives that we set out to achieve at the beginning of this webinar. And having uh, heard from our colleagues from Pop Council on the review of the evidence-based strategies and the innovative methods that were shared, such as the video from South Africa and the presentation from IDI Uganda, would like you to share whatever concerns and questions you have right now. If you can, if you can't, you can also send us an email or a message after this webinar. Please do not forget to complete the poll that will be on your screen right now. So please feel free to let us know what you think about the webinar and complete the poll. Thank you. Should you have things your country is doing uh, with regards to SGBV and you want to share or you want to share with the SLN and Sikona, please feel free to share them with us. They could be best practices, they could be ongoing programs, they could be um, policies and documents and programs, whatever they are, please feel free to share with your country engagement leads or anyone you know on the Sikona SLN projects so that we can uh, disseminate to other colleagues as well. If there are things you've learned from this webinar that are so wonderful that you want to replicate and need further support, please do not hesitate to reach out to any of us. You can always reply to the email you received for this webinar to seek further information. The webinar, the webinar pool is on and it's just five questions and it's very simple. You just have to click your yes, your no, and partly and what whatever that is uh, your choice of response is to the question that is on the poll. Please do not forget that we have other webinars planned for this week. We look forward to having you and to having more in-depth conversations with regard to HIV prevention. Please look out for 
the feedback emails that you would receive sometime later this week or early next week concerning this webinar. We'll send you the recording and presentations and always look at the SSLN website for more information and to go back in time for other things we've done on Sikona. Thank you very much. And please do not hesitate to, co to complete the pool before you log on. Dear colleagues, we thank you uh, for your participation in uh, this webinar. Please note that we are able to improve the choice of our topics and uh, focus for our webinars based on your feedback. So please do not hesitate to just complete the pool. It would not take you anything more than two minutes maximum. Please uh, complete the pool in front of your screen. If you have challenges seeing the pool or understanding any of the questions, we are right here. Please feel free to share your concerns and questions with us and we'll be at your service. Oh, I see there is um, a question in the chat. Yes, we we find out and we will share our response with you when we share the notes and the recordings from the webinar. And Dr. Shegun is asking about the proportion of boys that are involved in the Dreams Project or if it is only about girls. Thank you everyone for your wonderful participation. Please, before you log off, know that we would share with you all our responses via email that will come to you much more later this week or maybe early next week. And please do not hesitate to complete the poll. Should you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to us. We are right here on the call. And thank you so much for your participation at this webinar. Dr. Shegu, I see um, Julie has responded to you and Sanyota as well. Should you have more questions, please, before you log off, do not hesitate to put them on the chat and we'll surely respond to you. Madonna, I think, um, Goretti, if you're on, you may want to uh, answer the question about boys' involvement in the dreams yes. project. And we, yeah. I didn't know that. Yes. From Madonna, whether I should respond to it or not. Please feel free, Goretti. We are all right here. You can put your response, and of course, we'll still add them to the email that will go out. Thank you very much. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much for the interest in the dreams program. So, what I mentioned that the district action center sexual violence for both boys and girls is brought in that we have, but for the dreams program for all the last five years, we've been focusing on adolescent girls 10 to 24. But this copy beginning October, we are taking on boys enrolled. And the key thing that the boys are going to learn is violence prevention. So that's a very key add-on that I hadn't brought in, but it's the boys are going to be 10 to 24 will be trained on violence prevention. Before we've been working with partners of the girls, not other boys within the community, mainly only the partners of the girls. But now purposely we are getting siblings and other high risk boys between 10 to 24 and training them on violence prevention. Madonna, that's that's it. 
Yes, thank you so much, Goretti. Thank you, thank you for that. Colleagues, it's been very wonderful chatting with you and discussing with you on this very sensitive topic. Thank you so much for your participation and we wish you a wonderful day ahead and a wonderful evening ahead, depending on where you are. Please thank you for joining us and look forward to our mails and communication. For more information, please do not hesitate to look uh, to go through the website. And should you need any help or need anything at all, please do not hesitate to reach out to any of us. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.